Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and Adam, your co-host. We have a couple news items this week, but they have a theme to them. So starting off, let's give um, some empathy to the Dropbox incident response team. They suffered through a breach um, starting on October 14th. And so they released a statement about it and what happened. But essentially, GitHub notified Dropbox of some suspicious activity that was happening. And... They reacted very quickly. They did their investigation. The breach was a result from a phishing attack that targeted multiple Dropbox employees using email impersonating one of their CICD delivery platforms called Circle CI, and it redirected them to a phishing page where they were asked to enter in their GitHub username and password. Some of the emails, according to Dropbox, were caught by their secure email gateway, while others did get through. And on the same phishing page, the employees were asked to use their hardware authentication key to pass a one-time password. Now that stuck out to me because the page asked for that, but turns out Dropbox had not implemented all hardware or fish resistant MFA at that point. And so I think, you know, instead of actually using a hardware token, they were either... Pr- you know, had to put in the one-time passcode manually, or maybe it was a push notification or something like that. So it was not a fish-resistant MFA. So the investigation found code was ac- uh, accessed by the attacker, um, and it contained some credentials, primarily API keys that were used by Dropbox developers. The code and the data uh, included a few thousand names and email addresses belonging to Dropbox employees, current and past customers, sales leads, and vendors. And all in all, 130 of Dropbox code repositories were stolen. However, no code for core apps or infrastructure was accessed, nor were any customer accounts, passwords, or payment information. So they didn't get the crown jewels. They did get some things. I don't think it was terrible. So fortunately for Dropbox's uh, IR team, it was not as serious as it could have been. As a result of the breach, um, like I said, they were currently in the process of adopting fish resistant MFA, but had not completed. They've accelerated that deployment due to the breach. And they said soon their entire environment will be secured by web auth N with hardware tokens or biometric factors. And they also uh, offer web auth N to Dropbox customers. So as a customer, you can use a hardware token to uh, have as your MFA factor for your own Dropbox. So, All in all, I think um, it was not as bad as it could have been. You know, phishing is still an issue. Probably would have been stopped by fish-resistant MFA, and they are upgrading to that as as a result of the breach. Not a whole lot to add to your analysis. I would say... I I was really excited to get like my first FIDO2 key when that kind of first became a thing. And Dropbox is one of the very first to support that. Remember, there weren't a lot of sites you could use it at initially, and Dropbox was one of them. And um I mean, you know, then not a lot to say, but if they go fish resistant across the org, they're ahead of the game for sure. There's not a lot of orgs doing that org wide. But as a tech company, I think that's a reasonable step to take. I really do. Um, and probably would have prevented this, but, you know, attackers are clever. They might have found another way. Yeah, and it's it's a theme throughout this episode because our next story has to deal with Twilio. And we've mentioned them because they did have an attack in August And as part of that investigation, they recently released that they actually had two attacks, one in June and one in August. And the breach in August was due to a smishing attack or an SMS phishing attack. 
And so SMS messages, text messages were sent to a bunch of Twilio uh, employees from attackers that were impersonating the IT department, and they asked them to click on a URL containing Twilio, Okta, SSO keywords that would redirect them to a sign-in page clone. And one of the messages was successfully you know, baited, and one of the Twilio users uh, put in their, their password. And so as part of the investigation, they also revealed that an attack happened in June where the attacker used a social engineering technique called vishing, which is voice phishing. So another phishing attack, but through a phone call where they were able to convince an employee to give their credentials over the phone. So I, again, I just thought it was interesting to put this story in here, mainly because these are old school techniques. I mean, they've been around for a long time, smishing and vishing. Like you don't hear about attacks like that anymore because most of the time, employees and users in general have been at least educated on that front and hopefully would, you know, raise the red flag and not um, fall for these type of attacks, but it's still working. And as a result, again, with the June and August breach, Twilio reset all the credentials of the compromised employees and is distributing FIDO2 tokens to all employees. So another company that is upgrading to a fish resistant MFA as a result of some old school fishing techniques. So I, again, kind of a theme here, but um, as you see the, the landscape, you can see this type of attack happening more and more. And we've talked about it on the podcast as well. The CISO at Microsoft, Brett Arsenault has kind of adopted this almost catchphrase that he drops regularly now. And I've seen it in other places too, so I'm not going to say he originated it, but it's that attackers don't break in, they log in. And that's basically what this is, right? I mean, the, these aren't some cloak and dagger zero day that was smuggled out of the Soviet Union or something. And, you know, somebody's breaking into some obscure DLL and Windows or whatever. I mean, this is just literally like, I'm going to call somebody up and ask them to give me their password and they do. Right? And I mean, we... Like you said, we do talk about this on the show regularly where we say the best way to get an employee's ask for, password is ask for it and they'll usually give it to you. And, um, you know, friend of the show, Christina Murillo, who, who had appeared on the show in the past was highly critical of a lot of orgs doing these like, you know, phishing exercises that attempt to kind of trick their own users. And that's a whole other can of worms. But part of her argument for why she said that should be low value because in all honesty, just because somebody steals your user's password shouldn't mean anything, you know? And so the, the fact that these tricks, I mean, are always going to work. You're always going to be able to social engineer someone, but there should be technical mitigations in place that even if they do fall for it, that's not enough. I think the example would be the Dropbox one, right? Because at least the data was structured and segmented in a way that even after the data breach happened, the customer data, which is their business, right? The, the customer drop boxes and um, payment information like PCI data, that was all segmented off so that the attacker wasn't able to get it or they were able to react fast enough to the incident. You know, either way, it was, I think, a good practice in both data protection and incident response. Absolutely, yes. The the most important stuff stayed safe. By the way, total random note, I canceled my Dropbox literally years ago. And I mean years ago when I joined Microsoft and I got such a great deal on OneDrive uh, with our employee pricing. But anyhow, I canceled it years ago. And, you know, they, they'll say things like, oh, you know, after you cancel, you know, within 90 days, we'll delete your data or something. They're still telling me, Years and years and years later, I mean like three, four, five years. Hey, come back to Dropbox. Your data stopped syncing. Uh, just just pay up and, and we'll be good and, and you can sync your data again. And it's like, you still have that, guys? Like, I haven't given you money in years. Why are you retaining that? I'm not so upset like that they've retained my data. I'm just kind of amazed that it's 
they think it's in their best interest to do that, um, to hold on to it so long after somebody stops paying. Anyhow, random side note about Dropbox, but. I mean, that, that brings up a good point of just data hygiene in general. Mm-hmm. I think we've mentioned that on our show before. Like, you should make sure that uh, if you don't need it, to remove it. Like, in this case, if it's a paying customer, yeah, keep it. But if they're not paying anymore and it's been years, you should just delete the data. One, because it's just data that is there taking up space, but also two... If it's there, it's discoverable. It's it's to able to be captured by, you know, attackers if they actually get to it. So I mean, there's no reason um, to keep it around. They're using, and that's the same they're for, using it as a sales pitch, which is even kind of weirder. Yeah, I don't know if any listeners have had that same experience, but I thought that was tremendously odd that after all this time. Yeah. So another um, along the same vein of. Uh, this whole fish resistant MFA and, and, and whatnot, uh, CISA released some guidance on fish resistant MFA. I'll put the link in the show notes. It's a really good document to read over. They talk about some cyber threats specifically to MFA fishing being one of them, um, push bombing or MFA bombing push fatigue. Another one that we've talked about on the show exploitation of SS7 protocol vulnerabilities, which is SMS or texting or uh, phone messages, and then SIM swap. And that's another social engineering um, method where, you know, they'll, they'll basically get control of your SIM through your, uh, through your provider and then gain access to your phone number, which if you have SMS, uh, MFA linked to it, then of course, once they take over, they, they have access to that. Have you tried so, to do a SIM swap recently? Like a legitimate one? I have actually. Um, You're on T-Mobile, for, right? Yes, for and T-Mobile. I, and I am too. And I, I, I will say my experience was it was pretty hardcore and I was glad to see it. I was like, guys, this is awesome. What was your experience? It was very, it, I would say it was very protected it was a very protected process Mm -hmm. and so um i actually put it off for a very long time because i wasn't doing it for my phone i was doing it for my wife's phone and so she had to be around to verify some certain things and it was was, i could not do it on my own even though i'm the primary account holder Mm -hmm. so yeah i thought it was very good i think providers at least in the u.s have gotten better about that Mm -hmm. um at least the big ones i don't know about the the more smaller subsidiaries, um, whatever the you want MVM, to call them. MVNOs or also like the regional carriers. Correct. Yep. Yeah. I think, I, I don't know how well they are, but I think the big ones like Verizon and AT&T, um, T-Mobile, I think those, they have definitely shored up a lot of their, um, at least the SIM swap attack. Mm-hmm. Um, In the CISA guidance, there is a chart of fish-resistant MFA um, strengths or MFA uh, from strongest to weakest, essentially. Um, And the the most uh, fish-resistant one would be the FIDO or the web authentication or public key infrastructure, PKI-based. And those are fish resistant and completely immune to push bombing and SIM swap and all of that. Um, the second being the app based authentication using a one time passcode or mobile push with number matching um, or a token based one time passcode, which is, you know, like a hard token that cycles through a phone number or I'm sorry, like a six digit code that you have to enter in. Those are vulnerable to phishing attacks. But they're, of course, resistant to push bombing um, and uh, immune to the SIM swap attacks. Um, And then the second to lowest one would be the app-based authentication with just a push notification with no number matching. And then the final and um, least um, fish-resistant one would be SMS and voice. Um, And in this, they actually say it should only be used as the last resort 
or serve as a temporary solution while you transition to something stronger. So um, pretty good documentation to walk through. Um, you know, last week we talked about conditional access um, in being in preview for um, MFA strength. So um, before Azure AD, you can now test that and sp- specify a specific application or user or group um, with a targeted MFA strength, um, whether it be fish resistant or password list or something like that. So definitely look at that. Um, in the documentation, they talk about implementation, um, prioritizing different phases. Um, for example, what resources you may want to protect um, as well as high value targets. You know, maybe you don't do it for everybody, but maybe you do it for specific data that you need to access or users who are more likely to be targeted with phishing attacks. So, um, yeah, and then I, I just had a, a quick thought too about, um, you know, I remember being in IT and moving from like SMS to app-based MFA and one of the um, one of the uh, pushbacks that we got from some of the users was that they didn't want to put, you know, company data on a phone that was personal that wasn't being paid for by the company. And as these type of attacks are starting to become more and more prevalent and we have to move to stronger authentication you know, methods and uh, stronger MFA methods, I, I'm starting to think that maybe security should start to work with the HR departments to restructure the employee contracts because, you know, as an employee to a company, you're not paying for my car or you're not paying for um, transportation for me to get to my work site. It's just expected that I show up to work, right? And a lot of companies also require a phone number, just a phone number to be contacted in general, um, but they're not paying for that phone, but you need to have a phone number. And so I just think if you're working with your HR to restructure that, maybe you require a phone, like a smartphone, to be terms of employment. You're not getting paid for it, but if you have a smartphone, you can be expected to put at least the MFA app on there. Um, and if there really is, I mean, I, I know I dealt with some really old school folks who just they didn't even have like a smartphone maybe not even a flip phone and they just refused to have one um well then you can issue them a fido2 key um you know maybe you can't do it for everybody but if for whatever reason they literally don't have a cell phone um, or they're just using a flip phone get them a fido2 key and that's what they use for mfa or you could use windows hello for business which we've talked about as their MFA factor if you're using Azure AD federated applications and Windows Hello for Business. So, I mean, there are options, um, but I was just thinking like, you know, companies don't pay for cars and we got to get to work, right? So um, I don't know why we can't put a smartphone as terms of employment um, as for security purposes, right? To have an MFA token on it. So I like that. I like that comparison to, you know, it's an expectation to have reliable transportation to work. And you don't have to have a high paying corporate job for that to be an expectation. That's an expectation of almost any work. And there's an expectation that you're reachable, that you have a phone number that I can reach you at to call you and let you know stuff. So it's truly not that different. And again, by this point, We just should have an exception process. If somebody just wants to object for whatever reason, fine. Here's your FIDO2 key and be done with it. And you're right. Windows Slow for Business is actually an acceptable solution too because it's built into their laptop. They're already obviously not using a smartphone or anything because they don't have one or they're refusing to. So you don't need to support any other device. Here's your one company issue device. The MFA is kind of built into it. There you go. You know, problem solved. Like, we give too much time of day to this. Like it's really, it's very uncommon. There's very few people that do it. You'll have one or two. Don't spend your time sweating like one or two or three people in your whole, you know, multi thousand person org. Just create an exception process, issue them a YubiKey, go on with life.
The final thing that I wanted to talk about is something that was um, part of the technical airlift. I watched a video on this and I thought this was a great new feature. Um, it's called Enhanced Fishing Protection, which again fits with our whole theme tonight about fishing. Um, and it's built into Microsoft Defender Smart Screen. It's a new feature, part of Windows 11 22H2. So what it is, is it works alongside uh, Windows security protections and it helps protect typed work or school passwords used to sign into Windows 11. And it does that in three different ways. And I found this to be really, really cool. Number one, if a user types their work or school password into any Chromium browser. So for sure, this is going to work with Edge, but it also will work with Chrome if that's the browser that you're using, um, as long as you have smart screen turned on. Um, if they type their password that they've signed into the device with, um, or it's their M365 password, and they enter it into a site that's deemed malicious by Defender Smart Screen, enhanced phishing protection will alert them. It'll also prompt them to change their passwords so attackers can't gain access to the account. If you're reusing your password, enhanced phishing protection will warn users that they reuse their work passwords on multiple sites or apps and prompt them to change their password. And finally, enhanced phishing protection will warn users if they store their work or school password in a notepad, Word, or any M365 Office application. And it will recommend that they delete their password from the file. So really cool protection. On the video, I, I saw where someone just entered in their password into a site that was not M365, and Smart Screen popped up a, an actual warning, and like a toast warning, as well as uh, one of those where it kind of overlays on your screen and says, hey, you've done, you, you know, reused your password or you're entering in your school password on a site that um, you shouldn't. So um, you can configure this via GPO. Uh, there's CSPs or configuration service providers, um, which you can use with any NBM, as well as natively with Intune, you can use a settings catalog policy. So it's all natively built in. You have to have Defender Smart Screen turned on. Um, that's included with Windows Enterprise or Education Edition, um, at least the managed version of it. Um, and then uh, this enhanced phishing protection will work with that. And again, you have to be on Windows 11 22H2 for this to work. I think Windows 11 is really starting to deliver on its security promise. And I guess before I go a whole lot further, I should give the usual statement that Andy and I both work for Microsoft. Um, we are Microsoft employees, uh, but Windows 11, you know, a lot of what was promised by the requirements for TPM and some of the other uh, requirements like 8th gen Intel Silicon were all around security. And I think we're really starting to see that come to fruition where there are security features unique to Windows 11 that are truly valuable and really, really helpful. And also, the code base is starting to diverge, whereas you could say at one point, Windows 11 was like Windows 10 with a fresh coat of paint, and that wasn't really fair or true, but you know, you could have made that argument. But Windows 11 now, you know, it's been in market more than a year, and it's really starting to, to get, a, get a, a feature set of its own that's really unique to it. And so... Now we're starting to see some really compelling reasons for orgs, enterprises, to start looking at adopting Windows 11. And this is definitely one of them. This is very cool stuff. And that's our show for this week. Hopefully you learned something. Definitely check out some of the links that we have in the show notes, specifically on the CISA uh, Fish Resistant MFA Guidance. And I'll have the documentation for enhanced phishing protection as well if you want to turn that on for your org. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks, we'll talk to you guys next week. 
Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.